I just kept getting up and then getting up. Was I was trying something else. Um, with Halloween, Let me know when I it. I think it's good now. It's it's showing that it's good. What am I trying to say? That's it. Okay, I know. Right, I can go. Yes. Hi, everyone. Sarah Taylor. I'm here. 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 So I wanted to do a lesson to the Slides will be available. I don't see anyone scanning. Oh, I see one person. Nice. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next announcement. So next Friday, if you're interested in any of those areas, go ahead and scan the QR. And I think we're good. All right, so embedded system. So in general, there will be like three sections. We'll talk about what an embedded system is, how they can be attacked, and how security can be implemented and defenses for them. So one quote that I like is, everything that's usable can be misused, which is commonly seen in embedded systems. Uh, basically, as IoT devices are growing, uh, you can see that there's a potential for those embedded systems to make our life easier. However, security is often an afterthought. So uh, with the increase, there's also the increase for adversaries or hackers to target these embedded systems and potentially misuse them. All right, so uh, a good comparison is embedded systems versus computers. So uh, I have a computer shown, and I guess apparently it's an older computer because I saw that floppy disk up there like earlier today when I was looking through my slides, and I was like, ah, that must be a very old picture because I'm sure, I don't know if anyone in here knows about those, but um, my parents actually showed me one like a few weeks ago. So anyways, uh, so you have your basic uh, computer components. It's a uh, computer is multifunctional. Uh, it has memory. Uh, a CPU and a hard drive to store. But the main thing is that you can see these parts you can easily switch out. Like if you want to upgrade your motherboard, you can switch that out. If you want to upgrade your uh, hard drive, you can switch that out and things like that. And it's multifunctional, like you could write software on it. And so embedded systems, you can see here, uh, it's not upgradable where it's not very easy easy to switch out the parts. Most everything is usually embedded on a board. Sometimes it's embedded on a single chip. And uh, this 
is a good example I found. You can kind of see that it will have the uh, memory CPU hardware unit. Uh, generally, embedded systems are a single purpose use. And, and like I said, you will generally replace the entire thing when you want to upgrade it. So to go in a little bit more in depth on embedded systems, uh, basically, um, it's a combination of hardware and software that's designed to do a set of function or functions. And this uh, embedded system is usually a controller that's part of a larger design, which we will talk more about later. Uh, some main embedded systems are based off of microprocessors, microcontrollers, system on chip, or FPGA. Uh, micro Processor is a little more outdated than a microcontroller. More today, you'll see microcontrollers and system on a chip. Uh, but basically, um, microprocessors are like integrated with memory and peripheral interfaces, um, and they usually have external chips. And uh, like a system on a chip is what it sounds like. It's a system on just a chip. The FPGA is an integrated circuit that's designed to be more configured by a designer, um, so hence the term field program programmable. And uh, if you have any questions on those, we can talk more get about those at the end of the presentation. Uh, but here's a basic uh, graph that I kind of drew or made up. For embedded systems. So you can see that you have uh, the analog, digital, you have the input, and then it goes to the embedded system, which has the hardware, software, and then you have the output. Uh, sometimes you'll have a user interaction, like for example, uh, a handheld or like a handheld mouse, um, like an optical mouse. I will take pictures of the surface um, as you're using the mouse. And as you move the mouse around, it will calculate like, the general X, Y locations. And so that's the input. And then the output is where the mouse moves on the screen. Yeah. Okay, so then you have your uh, hardware and software. I just wanted to highlight those a bit more that you've seen in the previous slide. So let's talk about the history of embedded systems. So I found this nice graph that kind of shows the growth of embedded systems. So 1998 was really the first year that like embedded processors or systems surpassed computer processors. And then as you can see, the rise of IoT devices that only goes until 2009. And then uh, currently today's market, you can see in the graph I've included that embedded systems makes about 99% of the market while like computers makes up just about 1%. So uh, the need for learning more about how to secure embedded systems uh, is definitely needed. So going through a little bit more of the history, uh, in the 1940s, you had the Colossus, which was a giant computer that if you haven't heard of it, you basically took up the entire room and just for the computer. And then moving on to the 80s, you had the IBM's Acorn. Uh, and then later you had about the 90s, you had like laptops starting to come out. And then the 2000s, you had your smartphones which we'll talk more about where they lie with computers and embedded systems in a bit. And then you started to see IoT devices coming out in 2010, uh, like wearables. And now or in the near future, we're starting to see smart homes and uh, more like uh, automotive uh, is an example that I wanted to put up, which we had to talk about that earlier this semester, but uh, the, uh, like, smart cars or some automobiles have a lot of sensors, uh, which include embedded uh, systems in that. And in some of the slides, you can see that I put a source down at the bottom. So if you're interested in learning more about any of these slides that I don't want to like elaborate too much on, uh, feel free to visit that source. So 
So some pros and cons about embed systems. Uh, so basically the key benefit of embedded systems is <clears throat> their ability to work in real time and solving their task with uh, basically like little or no delay. And such performance is achieved by optimizing the system resources and hardware to perform one activity. And because of this optimization, using an embedded system is cheaper and less power consuming than building a more complex device. And with the correct software, an embed system can behave predictably and perform well in any environment. And these systems are also convenient for hardware engineers as embedded devices are small and need external communications. So some drawbacks of the embedded system, um, you can kind of see the flip side that power is and memory is limited. Uh, and that arises because of their compactness and dedication to a single task usually. And, and they need certain skills or expertise to create the software that embed systems perform. Um, so that could be a limitation and maybe they're not as scalable. Okay, so why learn more about embedded systems? Well, embedded systems are part of your daily life, most likely. can be found in cars, medical equipment, uh, found in smart TVs around your household. You might be wearing one right now. And uh, a lot of careers could be found kind of centered towards or around embedded systems, such as an embedded systems developer, um, and machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, those are some core concepts that are found in the embedded system kind of field. Uh, and then you have technopreneurship. <laughs> uh, te uh, technopreneurship. There we go. Uh, which basically, um, you can guess what that means. Uh, <laughs> you want to build something awesome and you have the skills because you know embed systems, you can create something new. Uh, you can be an entrepreneur, you can start up uh, like a tech, small tech startup or a Kickstarter um, and try to market that with your embed skills, embed system knowledge. And also, as kind of mentioned earlier, there is such a large market growth around embedded systems. And actually, so in 2020, it was around 88 billion dollars in this embedded system market but that's projected to grow all the way to about 140 million a billion sorry by 2028 so that's quite a bit of a projection growth there okay so let's go into some basic examples uh so here um one of the most basic examples of an embedded system is a router and most everyone has a router in their home and uh, this is the inside of a router. So you can kind of see uh, it's just one board and uh, has an internal antenna, it has uh, memory, and everything's kind of soldered on the board here. And okay, I'll go on. So let's talk about some other embedded systems. So for a few of these embedded systems, I put a graph by them so you can kind of see how the embedded board or system would work. Um, but uh, video game consoles like Xbox, PlayStation, uh, they can contain embedded system boards. Uh, you have like a smart thermometer or a central heating unit. Uh, GPS, calculator, and you have all your smart devices. So your smart light bulb, uh, like the chip in your credit card, uh, like your smart fridge, smart washing machine, uh, wearables, things like that. And so our phones in the bed system, well, that's a bit of a great area because they're they can be multifunctional like a computer, but they do just have one board um, like an embedded system. So they, so phones kind of stay in that gray area. 
Okay, so we'll talk about embedded systems and cyber physical systems next. Um, okay, so cyber physical systems basically revert, refer to um, like the next generation. Uh, oops. I'm sorry. Okay. So basically, uh, they're interconnect interconnected and they collaborate kind of through the internet of things and they help provide citizens and businesses with a wide range of innovation um, and innovative applications and services. And the term CPS comprises of an embed system, um, as you can see in the bottom, and it also comprises of a physical uh, environment, which is considered the dynamic part of the cyber physical system. And the embedded system is considered the processing part. So here are a few examples of embedded systems in cyber physical systems. And you have uh, robotics, which is a traditional area in which embedded and cyber physical systems have been used. Uh, the mechanical aspects are very important in robotics, so therefore they may be linked uh, to mechanical engineering. And robots are generally uh, in the cyber physical system area modeled after humans or animals. Then you also have avionics, which has a significant amount of uh, the total value of airplanes. And it includes flight control systems, like anti-collision systems, pilot information, and uh, the, the embedded systems can all actually decrease emissions, such as carbon dioxide from airplanes. And um, then you have the civil engineering area. So an example of that would be uh, like an artificial structure, like a dam. And the dams in particular generally do use embedded systems and they can be used to monitor the rise and fall of water levels within the dam, or they can even enable advanced warnings in case there is increased danger, such as the dam might be collapsing or overflowing. So we're gonna move in to the attacks that can happen on embedded systems. And so, um, you can kind of think that the attacker model is almost flipped with embedded systems. Um, the companies need to protect against consumers because embedded systems, the consumers can buy them. They can kind of hack however they want. I mean, they bought it. It's easier to um, interact with them that way. And we'll talk about a few examples in a bit. Uh, they also have physical access to interact with you. So therefore, if you have like an Alexa in your home or anything uh, that a hacker could get into, and then they could maybe do a man in the middle attack and eavesdrop. And then you also uh, basically need to understand how attacks like that can happen if you own any devices like that. Uh, what could go wrong? So going back to that example of a router, um, basically uh, if your router were to be intercepted, it could alter the DNS settings. Um, it could uh, reroute the traffic and maybe you'll visit an unprotected website when you thought you were visiting a protected website. You also have uh, smart light bulbs. Uh, if those were hacked, you can think of all the different things that could happen. Like perhaps they would control the lights, but also what if they turned the lights on and off really, really fast and it broke the light bulb? Or what if they wouldn't let you turn the light bulb on? 
um, smart thermometer, kind of the same idea. What if they were to make it so cold that you can't even be in your house or apartment or so hot that you can be in there and you had to get out? Um, so smart devices, eavesdropping, we talked about that. A badge reader. So if a, a hacker were to get access to that, uh, maybe you couldn't get into your building to work or maybe they wouldn't even like let you out. So that's just something to think about. Um, fitness tracker, a lot is used with the geolocation tracking, especially in like digital forensics, but we don't need to get into that. Um, but on the other hand, what do you want a hack, hacker? Do you want someone else to know where you are at all times? Um, and then you have medical devices, which if a hacker were able to alter what was happening or you would get possibly injured or maybe death could occur. So how can this happen? Uh, we have network-based and with network-based so network-based, you can think of it as a remote attack, which uh, can happen against an embedded device. And this must be performed when a hacker is truly like remote. And these attacks are commonly a greater threat because the attacker can be located anywhere in the world. And can this can be commonly abused via the internet. Some of these internet-based attacks are possible because manufacturers of these devices offer free updates. And when these free updates are offered, that means you're having uh, the internet open and the hacker can use that as a attack vector to get into your embedded system. The embedded systems also have uh, application portals for authentication to provide access to databases or sensitive information. And these embedded web applications can commonly be attacked through the internet. Um, and along with that, just a few things I have listed. Um, MITM is man in the middle, if you don't know. DDoS is a distributed denial of service. All right. And then there's software-based. So you have malware. Um, self-explanatory brute forcing the attacker can try again and again to break in through the software. You have um, memory buffer overflow, which basically occurs when a threat actor can write data or code to the memory buffer and it can overrun the buffer uh, to basically uh, overwrite the memory addresses and the application uses new data or a new executable code, the threat actor may be able to take control of the system or cause it to crash. Uh, you can also have improper access control, which basically uh, means that the software doesn't restrict when it should restrict a certain actor. And then you have improper input validation, which basically means that you're getting incorrect or missing information from anything that could possibly impact a program's control flow. Or data flow. Uh, you have cryptographic issues, which are weaknesses related to the use of cryptography and basically can be caused by missing encryption. And another thing that could go wrong is numeric errors, which basically refers to like several different categories of uh, numeric coding errors, uh, such as maybe like uh, incorrect math calculations or uh, data overflows from an external source. And you have side-based. So power analysis attack is basically based off the fact that power consumption inside of a, a device is a function of switching activities and therefore will be dependent on the data. So if the data is manipulated, um, a power analysis, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. And a uh, timing attack, basically that's more in cryptography and it's a side channel attack where the attacker attempts to compromise the crypto system by analyzing the time um, it's taken to execute the cryptographic algorithm. Um, no, just like general, and then I will be talking about dynamic power analysis later. 
But would you like to speak about fault power analysis or fault injection? Yeah. I have, yeah, I have slides on glitching. Okay. Well, you're welcome. Like, like I said, I didn't know much about embedded systems, and this is my journey of trying to learn more. So I'm happy to hear things. Like I make a mistake or anything. But I pulled from a ton of sources. And then you have electromagnetic analysis, which basically are side channel attacks that are performed by measuring the electromagnetic radiation emitted from a device and performing a signal analysis on it. And then you have your physical attacks. So in considering uh, physical attacks, you can uh, think about the supply chain. So when the hardware is being made and when the hardware is being transported in transit, um, it could be possible that either a disgruntled employee or maybe a hacker could get their hands on the hardware during that supply chain and alter the hardware in a certain way. And then uh, also a glitch attack, which I guess can, as you mentioned, could be a side channel attack or... Um, yes. Same thing. Okay. And I think that what happened is that the person that said that this was physical was might have been wrong in his presentation. Yeah, because he was he was what he said was like something like you pull the um like you he would like had a picture of someone like pulling it out of the wall like a certain amount and then the more I researched it I was like that's not right so mm -hmm. that's like a good thing about researching like whenever I research something here I try to double check it but um yeah so that's a good point but basically uh let's just consider hardware modification and then as physical and then you have reverse engineering uh we have UART and JTAG and we'll talk more about that so how likely is an attack well, it's really not that straightforward. Um, you had the PlayStation Vita, which ended up being very secure, and that's something maybe not a lot of people thought. But then you have other embedded systems that you expect to be secure, like maybe medical devices or like your smart lock on your house, and they end up not being that secure. And, okay, and then... So we're going to consider a remote attack. Um, in this case, it is an Alexa Go hack yourself. And <laughs> in this attack, uh, basically, it was used a malicious radio station to generate self-issued commands. And this attack is no longer possible at the time because it's been fixed. But basically, it took place when the hacker connected via Bluetooth uh, to the device, and it, he used a like, speech-to-text through so that he would use the speaker to have that speech-to-text, and then the Amazon Echo would pick that up as a voice command. So like, what are some things that could happen uh, if this was still an attack or if this attack were to happen? Well, usually your Alexa is connected to other smart devices, so it could control maybe like the lights or your microwave settings or maybe your smart door lock. Uh, it can also call any phone number. And if you consider like, why would that be important? Well, perhaps the hacker could call his own phone number and just be sitting on your Amazon Alexa listening in. And, uh, at least at that time, there was no like indication that a call was still on. It can also maybe make unauthorized purchases uh, without the victim being emailed because the attacker could likely already delete uh, that and um, it could also tamper with the user's calendar. It can uh, maybe impersonate skills and... Yeah. 
Yes. Mm. Yeah. So basically, oh well, yeah. Um. So basically, like the hacker has to be in range for the Bluetooth Bluetooth connection to work through the radio, uh, malicious radio signal. Um. And yeah. does that answer your question? There's also I have a link to this if you want to read the full article and like watch the video that talks about it. I think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the slides. Um, I think the slides will be posted, but I also include the answers at the end um, or in the speaker notes. It's probably in the speaker notes. So, oh, cool. so I wanted to share a side channel differential power analysis. So this is basically taken from a CTF question and uh, so basically, the uh, let's see. Basically, the side channel attack uses is using this differential power analysis um, to use possible differences in the power required to set the binary data bit to a value of one versus zero. And an attacker can exploit this imbalance by reducing the power consumption from a device as it encrypts or decrypts sensitive information. And the measurements will have a higher power consumption if more bits are set to one and uh, lower if the power consumption is set to zero. The leaked power signal is dependent on the key since the data value leaked um, after the S box, as you can see in the diagram, um, changed based on an exclusive OR. And Basically, the key is unknown, so you have two variables that are known, and you can use XOR to find the unknown key. And after the traces are measured from the AES power, as you can see on the right, they need to be in line up to help figure out the unknown key. And so let's talk about a glitch attack. So the Xbox uh, 3, well, we'll go into that later. But basically, the basic principle of a voltage glitch attack is uh, the short voltage. So you can either have a sun decrease, which is called a brownout, or you can have a sun increase, which is called spiking. Uh, you can also use this glitch attack to bypass code. Um, so you can have authentication or uh, bounce check or maybe uh, bypass memory read-write. And you can use these attacks on game consoles. Uh, they can be easily used on doors or, um, or safes. So basically, uh, you can use the glitch attack to force the code to skip at the exact point where it would be asking for the pin code on a safe and um, something you might want to check out if you're buying a safe, if it's vulnerable to that or not. And so the equipment required to design a successful voltage glitch attack on a device can be relatively cheap. Um, hackers will use a standard commercial FBGA development board. Uh, it's the one shown up here is called a Xilinks, which is the pronunciation I found online, a Xilinx board. And uh, they will use this to make connections um, and basically use the tools to, uh, I'm sorry, use basic circuit assembly tools to remove components uh, such as decoupling capacitors from the target. Okay. So going into a case study on this glitch attack, um, I researched a lot about the Xbox 360 glitch reset glitch attack, and this was actually found uh, by a French hacker named Cleagley. Um, this hacker didn't want to use this hack for illegal downloads. Of course, we don't condone that, but uh, you 
uh, he, this hacker wanted to play like his free games and use his system as he wanted. So that's why uh, he went out and found this attack. Uh, basically, you can, uh, let's see. So basically, as you can see on the top right, um, you have the Xbox, that's the Xbox board, and then they have uh, their own board connected for the FPGA. Uh, but the hacker who originally found this hack used that Xilinx board, which is shown below. And uh, there's a lot more that goes into this, so feel free to read more about it on the bottom. Right. But I just wanted to not go too in-depth in the code, but you can just kind of see uh, that for yourself if you're interested in reading more about it. All right, so let's go into some reverse engineering. So basically, you want to figure out how the embedded system works. You want to research the device, and then you want to try to break in, break apart, look at the physical components, uh, maybe look at the debugging ports. And you want to analyze the code, uh, look for any bugs, uh, dump the flash or dump the firmware, and then you want to try to trigger the bug vulnerability or exploit, and then examine your um, findings with reverse engineering. Okay, so one hacking tool that was mentioned earlier that I want to go more in depth on is uh, the UART, which interacts with debug ports. Um, it's basically a two-wire system that has a TX, which is transmission of data, and RX, which is the receiving of the data. And uh, basically, the UART serial communication has the data transmitted asynchronously. Uh, when two devices are connected, the RX pin will connect to the TX pin on the second device. Okay, so let's look at a case study for this. Um, again, this case study is really interesting. I linked a really awesome video in the bottom right corner. Um, and this video links to hacking, I believe, 40 things in 20 minutes. And uh, I believe it's three different speakers and I enjoyed listening through most of them, but I just pulled one example. Uh, but if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend watching that video. Uh, but here you can see the UART connection on the right. And this is for a, a printer. And when he made that connection and booted, uh, this is the menu that came up. <laughs> so enter your shell command. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, so that was like easy, right? Okay. Going on to a JTAG. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's satisfying. <laughs> yeah. Um, next, so the JTAG uh, can manipulate individual pins on components, uh, can alter the flash memory, and basically the TDI uh, that's shown. So here I kind of circled some of the pins that you would connect the JTAG to. It's just some examples, but the TDI is for t testing the data in, like the input from the debugger. Uh, the TCK is the test clock that clocks the data synchronously. Uh, the TMS is test mode select, which lets the devices know they're being debugged. And the TRST is the test reset, which is an optional signal that resets all the devices in the chain. JTAGs can also uh, run from like $10 up to $20,000. Uh, and some of them will actually like... the. You can maybe, there's one around uh, $170 I found that was like called the JTAGulator, not making that up, the JTAGulator. And that one will basically identify the pins that need to be connected automatically by um, basically like hijacking all the pins on the device and doing a boundary scan. And then some of the cheaper ones, you'll have to identify the JTAG pins yourself. And... 
So the next case study is with a router. And this one was interesting as well as it provided nice results. But uh, again, if you want a great talk with the person who did this, I linked it at the bottom. Uh, but with the JTAG, he used debug mode. And basically, the bus blaster will communicate over JTAG with the connections that are made to the pins. So then you can query the JTAG chain, which will show the device manufacturer. And once you enter the debug mode with the JTAG, you can use a command to detect flash or to detect the external memory that's connected to it. And this, uh, with that, you can extract the memory. And here, uh, after the memory was extracted into that dump dot bin, uh, he was able to find the router's password and the uh, SSID down there very easily, uh, among with a lot of other stuff. So basically, the, the bus blaster is used kind of between the, like with the JTAG connection. Okay. Okay. So just going into a few more of uh, one one or interesting, I guess, attacks that I found. Nothing too technical in these, um, but this smart attack was called uh, like the dolphins dolphin attack fool, and basically was found by researchers in China, and they set up a loudspeaker to broadcast voice commands that had been shifted to ultrasonic frequencies. And they said that they were able to activate this voice control assistant, um, basically uh, with the smart home speakers from being only a several feet away. So it wasn't like a very large range attack, but it was an interesting attack. Uh, when the U.S. researchers kind of figured this out, they worked around this and used a microphone, um, and they were able to process the like broadcasts at the ultrasonic level to more of like a normal voice. And it's suggested that an attacker could um, embed hidden ultrasonic commands, uh, maybe in online videos or broadcast them near a victim in public. Um, these are things that you might not be able to hear very well, which is an interesting attack. And since then, of course, since it's a known attack, they've been working to prevent it. And another one that I want to talk about that I feel like it's important to talk about is medical devices and how the embedded systems in them um, could be hacked because these are very important, it's like life threatening most of the time. But basically uh, with this, uh, a small battery powered device in the chest. Uh, and if this, uh, this device basically helps stop irregular heartbeats. And uh, an attacker with a short range access to this product uh, could uh, use the product's radio to maybe turn it on or off. They could uh, do like a replay, uh, modify, or intercept the data. Uh, all right. And to kind of finish up the talk, uh, how can embedded systems be better secured? Uh, they, you can disable any uh, debug interfaces. You can currently disable them in software with e-fuses. You can seal the board in anti-tampering, which might not fully prevent, but you could use something like epoxy resin to prevent probing of pins, or you can use a reflective glass. So basically this reflective glass um, reflected the lights off the board, and if it detected that one of the lights was not reflecting properly, it wouldn't work. Uh, you can utilize system on a chip, which is a single chip. Um, you can use glitch resistant hardware. Uh, basically from what I found on this is that like the glitching can corrupt bits, right? So with software, you could maybe add a second check to every if statement. Um, and make sure that the composites are also equal to each other. 
So if a hacker were to flip a bit, it would be very difficult for them to flip another. And for hardware, maybe you could have something like brownout protection um, to check if the voltage drops before a certain level. You can also think about remote updates, um, maybe something like over the air updates, which will not e need user interaction. And then finally, you can think of hardware security models, which can store cryptographic keys in. And so how difficult is it to create a secure embedded system? And this is just my thoughts on it after researching. Um, from my research and from what I've been taught, it's common. It, it's commonly an afterthought, and it's really some of these companies want to push out their product faster. They want to make revenue. Um, it takes time, and it's costly to hire people or to prolong the release of a product. And I believe that maybe it's not difficult as it seems, um, but again, it's just will the company use time to protect it properly? Will they think about it? before releasing. And then uh, announcements again, if he came in late, which I don't think anyone did. Um, and so here are some references. Uh, if you're interested in some of the slides, uh, the link will either be in the bottom right or in the speaker notes. And those are just some links if you're interested. And just remember, everything usable can be misused. And thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will try to answer them now. Or maybe we can have further discussion about embedded systems since I'm just now learning, um, studying them, and researching them. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sign. 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 CTF challenges going? Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw like a group. Were you in that group of students working on it earlier? No. Okay. Well, would you like us to put you in groups? Would that be helpful? Well, like what happened last semester when I was teaching is I actually like, I just forced everyone to be in one big group and I appointed a leader. So, yeah, just hearing that you haven't completed any makes me feel like I should do that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll tell the other uh, teaching fellows to do that if they agree. Um, I'll be out probably again for an inter another interview on Monday. So, yeah, it's just like the times keep lining up with the class. 
unfortunately, they don't, they gave me like one choice for Monday, so I just took that interview. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's with the Idaho uh, Laboratories, National Laboratories, for research and design, or, yeah, development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice meeting you. I loved your questions, so I hope uh, like you can find your answer. And I explained enough to get you started on learning more about embedded systems. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Yeah. Fine. Uh, I'm a second year master's student, so I sh should be graduating soon. If I find an internship, then I'll stay in the fall. If I don't, then I'm just going to be done. So, yeah. Good. So, Kopath, uh, I was like one of the founding, I guess, students. Yes, not, if, not I didn't found it. Uh, Kopath exists as like a nonprofit. Or, yeah, but I was one of the first students that signed up for it. And so uh, Eduardo was one of the first teachers who's now a guru that we talk about sometimes in our class. Um, but if you're interested in being a teaching fellow, I think you should do it. Have you seen the like advertisements for signing up for that? Yeah. So we, we can see, maybe you see if you have that email. If not, then let us know. We can see if their applications are still open. But it, it's fun. Yeah. 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 Hey, okay. I was like that too. I struggled in the course, and um, you get help from you get training over the summer. So if you want, if you like the stuff and you, you feel like like you haven't learned it in depth, but you want to learn it in depth and maybe solve the harder challenges and not just the easier ones, then like they'll train you in the summer and you can ask questions. Um, yeah. It's a time commitment. It's usually on Saturdays. It's kind of, yeah. But if if you want to go into cybersecurity and it's interesting, you want free teaching, free someone to teach you, and then be able to give back to students, it could be something. Yeah, and um, interviewers like that too. Uh, uh, the CISO of UTD actually mentioned that he looks for like four things I think on a resume: like formal education, uh, volunteer experience experience, uh, yeah, if you've had an actual career or not, and then all the stuff you do on the side, like your side projects. So that's something I generally advise to people. And the, I guess the volunteering doesn't have to be cybersecurity, but I mean, it's nice. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Uh, one of our officers, I think, talks about it, Siraj. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you gear it towards something you like, or do they tell you what to research? Yeah. Yeah. So you can make the most of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you said that you're going to be the manager or the, like, lower the person that designed it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I have it. Oops. Nice. Yeah. 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 Just like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. I mean, if so, if you see that's like disorganized, and maybe being the manager or something, you could like help fix. Oh, you. So those are separate. Okay. Never mind. Well, yeah. But I think like you just go with your gut. So that's the same with me. I dropped being an officer on like two other groups because, yeah, you can kind of feel like where you fit in the best or what you want to do with your time. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was nice talking to you. Thanks for saying hi. Good luck with your CTFs for class. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Nice.